Man, you have to love that, don't you? You just got to love that. Those just epic movie scenes that just show the exuberance and the joy that comes in the wake of a great victory. I, in particular, am kind of fond of the part where Jimmy Chitwood hits that buzzer beater for the Hoosiers, right? Well, of course, I'm an Indiana Hoosier, so why wouldn't I like that? But just, it's just so neat to see those, that beautiful combination of scenes and songs that just so powerfully, they move us and they inspire us because when we watch that and we hear those songs, we can actually just almost taste the victory, can't we? We just taste the victory of those scenes. And so as we journey into our final week, our final week into Psalms mixtape, we land on a psalm that has a similar tone as those movie clips. It's a song that's filled with joy. It's a song that's filled with just shouts of celebration in the wake of a great victory, Psalm 21. And it's a beautiful song that's actually written by David, the king of Israel. And he writes the song for the choir director. It's like he wrote it for the worship leader, right? And then he gives it to the people. And it was written in response to an answered prayer. Because if you read the psalm before it, you realize Psalm 20, the people are praying for victory. And then Psalm 21 is rejoicing in that victory. And so let's take a look at that. Let's actually, with our Bibles, we're going to read from Psalm 21. We'll have it up on the screen, of course. And I'm going to encourage you, if you have your Bible, keep your Bible open to Psalm 21, because we'll be going back to it throughout this morning. And so Psalm 21, the king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great is his joy in the victories you give. You have granted him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. You came to greet him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked you for life and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. Through the victories you gave, his glory is great. You have bestowed on him splendor and majesty. Surely you have granted him unending blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. Through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Your hand will lay hold on all your enemies. Your right hand will seize your foes. When you appear for battle, you will burn them up as in a blazing furnace. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and his fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, their posterity from mankind. And though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. You will make them turn their backs when you aim at them with drawn bow. Be exalted in your strength, Lord. We will sing and praise your might. Wow. Powerful song of victory. So what jumps out at you when you read that psalm, you hear that psalm, what jumps out at you? It's clearly a song of celebration, of victory. There's been a great battle, and there's this declaration of the, what the Lord has done. It's like that song we just sang, this we know. This celebrates that God, his power, his presence, and what he has done to the enemy, the proclamation of victory through Jesus and so what is at the center of this victorious celebration? When you read Psalm 21, what's at the center of it? And so I did this, decided to do a scientific analysis of all the words within there. And so I did that and, well, actually, no, I did a word cloud. You guys know what a word cloud is, right? I take the text and you take the text and you put it into some sort of computer program, whether it's an app, and you drop it in there. And based on the, the frequency of usage of words, they actually give you this picture. It's called a word cloud. So I used Wordle, and Wordle shows us this. Here's the scientific analysis, and Wordle says that the center of the celebration is actually the Lord. The center of the celebration is the Lord. Look closely at that, and as you look closely, you'll see the Lord's at the center, and everything good emanates out from him. Things like blessings, joy, strength, and victories, all of that. Isn't that amazing? The perspective of an app reinforces the truth of God's word, the power of God's word. And so today, I wanna actually look at this psalm from a couple of other perspectives, three in particular. 
And the first, pers- the per- first perspective that I want to look at is this perspective that this psalm is a celebratory song of David as the victorious king. A song that's filled with rejoicing, and it's not just David, but it's the people with him. So why on earth would the people rejoice? Well, the people rejoice because the king's victory was their victory. The king's victory was their victory. And so they were rejoicing with the king. Rejoicing with the king. And so no doubt that many of those that were singing and praising God, that because of the battle that had occurred before, they probably had suffered some loss. But they also realized and they knew that they were living in the amazing benefits and blessings of the victory of the king. And so what did they do? They rejoiced. They rejoiced. And so the king and the people rejoice for several reasons. First, they rejoice because the Lord supplies strength and gives victories. And we see that in verse 1 and verse 5, the idea that the Lord is the giver of victories. And what's interesting is that word victories. Actually, it's the the Hebrew word Yeshua. Yeshua. And that means salvation. The Lord gives salvation. The Lord grants salvation. We also know that the Lord answers prayers and grants blessings. That was another reason why the people rejoiced. And what kind of blessings, what are we talking about blessings? Well, if you read further, you see in verse 3, one of those blessings is this idea, it's a gold crown. Now, gold in that culture, it symbolized this enduring kingship, the supreme authority, a crown of gold did that. So one of the blessings was the crown of gold that the king received. Also, the king received never-ending life. He asked for it, and he received length of days forever and ever, it says in verse 4. And then finally, in verse 5, one of the blessings, actually three blessings, the king receives glory, he receives majesty, and he receives splendor. Now those, they sound like attributes of God, don't they? Well, they are. He had asked, God granted those, those divine attributes. And we also know that the people and the king were rejoicing because the Lord brings joy and extends love. And how does he do that? How does he bring joy? Well, if we look, we see in verse 6, it's in his presence. The king finds great joy in the presence of the Lord. And we know in verse 7, it says that his unfailing love, God's unfailing love, also brings boldness and confidence and courage. And the king's kingdom will not be shaken. The king will not be shaken because of what the Lord has given and what the Lord has done. And finally, we know the latter half. Verses 8 through 12. We love the first seven verses, but 8 through 12 kind of makes us uncomfortable. And that's because we're talking about what the Lord does to the enemy. And we know that the Lord provides protection and executes judgment. And we see that in the word, the enemies. Actually, that is anyone who stands opposed to God and his anointed king of Israel. Those are enemies. And so it says, how does God execute judgment? God's hand executes judgment. And not just God's hand, but God's right hand executes judgment. And we know that the right hand in that culture symbolized power, authority, supremacy. And in this case, it was the hand that would execute judgment, the right hand. And we think about the right hand man, the right hand person. This word this was rooted in, this comes from this. Someone who has given equivalent authority, someone who is appointed to execute the responsibilities of the leader the right-hand person. And we also read in further down that we find that the Lord will prevent and protect against the enemy's schemes. The enemy has been working against the king and the Lord provides protection. And how does he do this? His beautiful image in verse 12, it says that the enemy will turn their backs. Do you get what that's saying? He will turn their backs. And what that is implying in the language is that they're doing this. They're running in full-scale retreat, right? It's like a beehive behind them, and they're running in that direction. And why is it that they do that? 
because there's this beautiful image, the Lord standing with drawn bow, covering his, his friendly forces, covering the king and the enemies retreating, full-scale chaotic retreat. The Lord executes judgment on the enemy. This beautiful and powerful imagery and reminder of God's faithfulness to his people and to his anointed King David. But is there an even richer and deeper meaning behind this psalm? Something deeper, perhaps like when you hear a song for the first time. You hear the song, you like the melody, you like the tune, and you listen to the lyrics. You're like, wait a minute, let me check out those lyrics. Let me listen more. And then you begin to maybe research, and you look, and you go, you're like, ah, aha, I've got the full context now. There's even a deeper and richer meaning behind that song. Well, Psalm 21 is much like that. In fact, Charles Spurgeon, one of the most well-known English preachers, he was actually called the Prince of Preachers, lived in the late 19th century. And what sermon wouldn't be complete without a good quote from Spurgeon, right? And Spurgeon writes the following about Psalm 21. He says, It has been called David's triumphant song, and we may remember it as the royal triumphal ode. The king is most prominent throughout, and we shall read it to true prophet if our meditation of him shall be sweet while perusing it. We must crown him with the glory of our salvation, singing of his love and praising his power. The next psalm will take us to the foot of the cross. This psalm introduces us to the steps of the throne. You see, Spurgeon's referring to the next psalm, which is Psalm 22. And if you read in your Bible, Psalm 22 is that psalm that actually foreshadows Jesus' death and crucifixion. It's Jesus as the suffering servant. But this psalm, what Spurgeon says, it, it takes us to the steps of the throne. And really what Spurgeon's saying is when you look at the power and the brilliance of the language that's used in Psalm 21, it doesn't just refer to David as the victorious king. It refers to Jesus Christ like a beacon of light on a dark, foggy night in Pacific Grove, right? It's like a beacon of light that just beams and shines this powerful portrait of Jesus Christ as the victorious king. And so how does it do that? Let's take a little look deeper into Psalm 21 and let's look for some indicators of this. We look at verse one back in Psalm 21. It says, the king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great is his joy in the victories you give. Again, Yeshua. Salvation. How great is the king's joy in the salvation? So there's joy in the salvation of the Lord. And verse six, surely you have granted him unending blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. Joy in the salvation of the Lord, joy in the presence of the Lord. And so like the joy that filled King David in the salvation and the presence of the Lord, Jesus, the victorious king, rejoices and rests in the salvation and the presence of the Lord. And so if you've got your bulletins, this is your chance to fill in blanks. I know some of you have been waiting to fill in those blanks, and so this is your time right now. There's those bulletins. Here, you think about this. Jesus Christ, God the Son, on the cross endured unspeakable anguish, unspeakable suffering, unspeakable pain as he bore the weight of all mankind's sin. And as he did so, God the Father turned away. See, on the cross, Jesus, the king of all kings, he bore all sin for all mankind once and for all. Now, why would a king ever do that for his people? Why? We can take a look in Hebrews 1. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, I think we'll find the answer. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. 
And for the joy set before him, for the joy that set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You hear that? For the joy of making a way for salvation for all of mankind, the joy of salvation, the joy of bringing many sons and daughters to glory with him. That's why Jesus endured the cross. In Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, and in the power of his resurrection, he delivered us from the grip of sin and death and brought us into right relationship with God the Father. And he offered us the gift of living in his presence for eternity. And as this verse also tells us, when Jesus was finished, following his ascension into heaven, what does Jesus do? It says that he sat down. He sat down. Now, he didn't take a break. He had fulfilled the will of the Father. And so he sat down. And where did he sit? He sat at the right hand of God the Father, where he is still today interceding on our behalf, rejoicing in the presence of the Father as the victorious king. And he's seated in the place of honor, in the place of authority, and a place of power. And the words of Psalm 21 also point us to a king who requested and received the desire of his heart and everlasting life. Back in verse 2 of Psalm 21, we read, You have granted him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. And heart's desire, what it implies here is that the king's request was pure and it was within the will of the father. His heart's desire, not selfish gain. Verse 4, it says, He asked you for life and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. See, God answered the king's prayer. He answered his prayer and he granted eternal life. In a similar manner, Jesus, the victorious king, he requests and he receives eternal glory and everlasting life from the Father. We see this unfold beautifully in Jesus' prayer in John 17, the high priestly prayer, shortly before Jesus would go to the cross. And we read in John 17, verses 1 and 2, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. You see, Jesus' heart's desire was pure and it was to the will of the Father. His desire was to do the will of the Father and to glorify the Father. And that was to seek and save the lost, to bring salvation to his people and give them eternal life. And this would require the ultimate sacrifice, his sacrifice, to go to the cross as a ransom for us all, for our sin. And in so de doing Jesus' manner of death, would glorify the Father by bringing everlasting life to mankind. His death by crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven fulfilled Jesus' prayer to be glorified. Jesus prayed to be glorified and God the Father granted his request as the victorious king to receive eternal glory and everlasting life. And also we look at Psalm 21 and we see another picture of Jesus as the victorious king who rules and reigns over an eternal and unshakable kingdom of the Lord. Unshakable kingdom of the Lord. We look back in verse 3 of Psalm 21 and we see, you came to greet him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. There's that symbol again. God received the king and granted him this supreme kingship, this enduring kingship. Verse five says, through the victories, again, the salvation you gave, his glory is great. Through God's provision of salvation, this victorious king's glory 
and his authority will transcend time and space. You also read later in verse 5, it says, you have bestowed on him splendor and majesty. There's those two divine attributes again. God has appointed those and given those to this victorious king. And finally, in verse 7, it says, for the king trusts in the Lord through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. So within and with God's everlasting love, This victorious king will rule and reign eternally and will never be removed. And so scripture affirms Jesus as this victorious king, as the victorious king. And even before Jesus' birth, they proclaimed this. The angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and he said these words in Luke 1, verses 31 through 33. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. By the way, that's Yeshua. His name is the Greek name for salvation. The Lord saves. Verse 32 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. That sounds like Jesus, the victorious king who is going to rule and reign over an unshakable kingdom for all of eternity, even before Jesus' death. And finally, in Jesus, we not only have a king who rules and reigns for eternity, we also have a king who actively defends his people, who's actively countering the enemy's schemes and someday will appear again. He will appear again for battle and he will deal with the enemy and those who oppose him once and for all. We read in Psalm 21, verse 8, it says, Your hand will lay hold on all your enemies. Your right hand will seize your foes. When you appear for battle, you will burn them up as in a blazing furnace. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and his fire will consume them. These words, once again, help point us to Jesus, the victorious king, who returns and removes the opposition and enemies of the Lord. You know, and so often we think of Jesus as the merciful, tender shepherd and loving savior, and he is absolutely that. And he is also the victorious king, who will return again and will judge the world. And we're reminded of this by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. And he writes in verse 24, he says, Then the end will come when he, and that's Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. And that is the dominion of all those, all those forces who stand in opposition to him. The enemy destroyed, much in the same manner that was referred to in Psalm 21, is that the enemy will be destroyed once and for all. Once and for all. And so our response to that, what's our response to that portion right there? It's kind of an uneasy feeling, isn't it? But we can have total peace in knowing that our victorious king, Jesus, the victorious king, he's going to return and he will make things right. Justice will be served. He will judge the enemy and all those who oppose him. And so that gives us peace. That allows us to forgive because we know that Jesus, the victorious king, will return someday and judge That also gives us focus, does it not? There's freedom, there's peace, but also focus because we know that Jesus will come again. Now, what we don't know is when that will be because the Bible's very clear that only the Father knows. And so for us, we can have peace, we can have focus in knowing that Jesus is returning again and that as the victorious king, he will judge And we can continue as we live to serve and follow him all the days of our lives, knowing that the victorious king is coming again. And so we read this 
second perspective. And we say, what does this mean for us? What does this mean to us? It means everything, does it not? Because when we read Psalm 21 and we think about the victorious king, we also know that this could be a personal reminder of the victory that we have in Jesus, our victorious king. Jesus, our victorious king. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is like a powerful reminder, just like Psalm 21, of the victory that we have in Christ. And how do we get that victory? It says that God gives us. God gives us the victory. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. God gives us the victory. And what he does is through his grace, the greatest gift of all, he gives to us victory. The amazing benefits and blessings of Christ's victory. It means eternal life. Can I get an amen, church? It means forgiveness of sin. It means a resurrected body someday. And it means that we get to live in his power and his presence every day. The victory of the king, our King Jesus. And all we have to do is accept his gift of grace. That's all we do. Accept his victory. And so my prayer today is that for those in this room, and maybe even for those watching online or watching in the family worship venue, that you have accepted this gift of grace in your life, that you are walking in his victory. Because when we place our faith in Jesus and we choose to follow him, we receive the unending blessings of Jesus, the victorious king. And so like the people in Psalm 21, what can we do with that? We can live in the victory of the king. We live in his power, we live in his presence, and we live in his promise. And so because of his victory, not my victory, his victory, I can have hope. When everything around me seems hopeless, I have hope. I can have strength. When I think I can't go on another day, I absolutely can look to Jesus' victory and I can find strength because of what he's done and the power of his presence in my life today. I can find courage. I can have courage in the most fearful situations. Maybe it's, it's, it's at work. And maybe for some of you, it's going back to school this week. But I can find true courage in the victory of the king because he's won the victory and he is present with me in my life. And I can find peace. Man, we can find peace, that well-being, that that spirit and that rest of our spirit because we're in fellowship with him. I can find peace because of his victory. And I can find joy. This is the the deepest sense of joy. And what does that joy look like? It's this deep satisfaction and just gladness of heart. And that joy is just joy that can't just be contained. It has to come out, right? And we call that rejoicing. And so what does it mean to rejoice? When we look at Psalm 21, we actually can look at a couple of words. There's two words that are used to refer to the term rejoice in Psalm 21. And the first is giul. And that word actually is the attitude and action of favorable circumstance. And it's often expressed in shouts and song of praise. Giul. It's an attitude and action that's rooted in joy. And it's expressed outwardly in shouts of praise, songs of joy. Giul. And there's another word, it's called samach. And that means to regladden or to pass joy to another to re-gladden or pass joy. And what samach really means is, it literally means to brighten someone's face by holding a flame up next to their face and shining the light on their face. Samach. See, what we find then, rejoice, it's an outward expression then of an inward condition. And so without joy, I cannot rejoice. 
And so here's the question though, brothers and sisters, with joy, the joy of the victory that I have in Christ, how can I not rejoice? How can I not shout songs of praise and bring a life, and live a life that just brings others the light of that joy, the light of Jesus' victory? And so what are some ways, some practical ways as we wrap things up this morning that we can rejoice in the victory of Jesus daily? Well, the first thing we can do is praise and thank him. We can praise and thank Jesus for his ultimate victory and for his victories in our lives. Do you ever ponder? Do you ever intentionally take time to ponder what his victory means to you in your life and the victories that he has had in your life? Do we ever stop and take time, perhaps, to reflect? But do we actually write it out? And so one of the things I want to encourage you is this week, maybe even today, take some time and write out a thank you note to Jesus for the victory in your life, for the victories in your life. Take time. And I would never ask you to do something that I haven't done myself. So the other day, I was writing my thank you note to Jesus. Now, I'd read it for you, but unfortunately, I'm a retired army colonel and a preacher. So what does that mean? It's rather long. So... <laughs> But I was writing out my note, and I was writing in my office, and I felt this little tap on my shoulder. And I turned around, and there was my six-year-old granddaughter. And she said, Grandpa, what you doing? And I said, I'm writing a thank you note to Jesus. And she said, why are you doing that? And I said, because of the victory he has won in my life, and because I love him. And she looked up at me, those beautiful blue eyes, and said, I love Jesus too, Grandpa. And she walked away. And I was like, man, that's Samach right there. That's bringing the light and shining it on someone's face. And she just brought great joy. And what greater joy is there for a grandfather than to know that his granddaughter is living and knows the victory of Jesus Christ, six years old. And so we don't want to just write it out to Jesus. That's powerful. But one of the other things we should do is we should sing it out. We should praise God. And there's something beautiful. This morning as I listen to you sing, there's something beautiful about when God's children sing and proclaim the victory that he has won in their lives. Something powerful about that. It glorifies God. It lifts up the name of Jesus. And guess what? I believe, fervently believe, that it makes the enemy turn and run when he hears people praising God and glorifying Jesus. And we also know one of the ways that we can rejoice in daily is to pray for victories yet to come. Jesus has won the war. He has won the victory. But we still know that we, as his children, still face many battles. And some of us today are probably facing a battle or two. And so what we can do is we can go to Jesus, who is our intercessor, he's our mediator, and through the power of his presence, we have access to the Father. And we can bring those requests, we can pray for victory, and we can do that along others, alongside with others. And we can do, we can pray in humility, and we can pray in boldness, not in our own strength, in our own victory, because of his victory. And finally, we can celebrate and share the victories that Jesus has won. He has won the victory, and so we should celebrate and share those. We should samach. We should re-gladden people. We should move out, and we should let our lives proclaim the victorious Jesus, the King of all kings. And we do that when we celebrate openly and publicly, and we share our story. We share the story of what Jesus has done in our lives. To sum that up very succinctly, we can rejoice daily by writing it out. We can sing it out. We can pray it out. And man, we can live it out in the victory of the King. Will you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, our victorious King, like you, there is no other, and we thank you today for your victory. And so, Lord, as we have gathered in this place and we proclaim those songs of joy and celebration, we've listened to your word, and we, Lord, we are so, so deeply thankful and grateful 
for your sacrifice for us and the victory that you have won for us.